It's like me can introduce me. Okay, uh, sit shortly. Uh, he is um, he's working working at Durham University. Durham University. Durham University as an tutor and recently taught a course in non-European philosophy at the at the University of Wolverhampton as a lecturer. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to give him that floor. Right, well, this is hopefully not going to be treading on people's toes too much, but I'm going to, um, in this presentation I want to look at uh, Heidegger and Nishitani in a kind of broader context of Heidegger's interest in East Asian thought and the fact that Keiji Nishitani appears somewhat conspicuous by his absence from Heidegger's dialogue and language, which is probably the work where Heidegger most directly addresses non-European thought. Um, this contrasts with thinkers such as Hajime Tanabe and Kuki Shuzo, who um, Heidegger also encountered. Uh, um, while Nishitani also focuses his discussion about Heidegger largely on Heidegger's early writings, and he describes Heidegger as being a creative nihilism, and as such still part of European nihilism. Um, and this time he does not discuss Heidegger's uh, own engagement with East Asian thought uh, in the self-overcoming of nihilism. And he doesn't discuss Heidegger's late writings either. In fact, he says, of late, we are beginning to see a turn in the standpoint of Heidegger. Uh, but he does not explain this further. Now, what I want to do is in this um, presentation focus on the key significance of Heidegger's uh, dialogue with East Asian thought in his later writings and how this relates to Heidegger, to Nishitani's own project of, um, particularly through the key concept of Europeanization and then technology and nihilism and finally consider sunyata and then afterwards suchness in both Heidegger and Nishitani as in a sense far side of nihilism, um, particularly the late Heidegger. Also consider the issues of Heidegger's turn, which will relate quite a lot to the sort of shift from the um, uh, personal. Uh, anyway, the, um, the key thing to remember in Heidegger's dialogue, the key point of Heidegger's dialogue, which is perhaps often overlooked by commentators such as Reinhard May, who are more interested in placing the dialogue in Heidegger's biographical development, is the question of Europeanization, as Heidegger puts it in the dialogue, a process which I would call the Europeanization of the earth and man. Um, Nishitani also uses this term in a way that is somewhat interchangeable with Westernization. Um, uh, Heidegger too admits the foreground of Japan is altogether European, or if you will, American. Um, however, um, both um, Nishitani and Heidegger see Europe as being uh, the tradition which has assimilated Japan, even if, as Nishitani points out, the major world powers today, well, in his time, they were Russia and the US, um, were non-European, but it's still, in a sense, a Europeanised world for both Heidegger and Nishitani. We might also say it is still going to be a Europeanised world, even if the third major world power is China. Uh, I think that's uh, a controversial point, but yes, I think it's true. Um, so what does Heidegger mean by Europeanisation? In contrast to his predecessor, Husserl, Europeanisation is, appro is approached by Heidegger in an ambiguously negative and destructive way. Europe, the Europeanization from uh, earth and man attacks at the source of everything that is of an essential nature. It is clear, as Halper states, Heidegger sees Europeanization as a statement of global predicament. However, at the same time, he Heidegger holds that many people might see Europeanization as nothing more than progress. Um, he, as the uh, Japanese interlocutor states, the triumphal march of reason at the end of the 18th century in the French Revolution was not reason to claim the goddess. This march of reason is, I believe, a direct reference to Hegel. Hegel, of course, being the thinker for whom progress goes from east to west. So, in a sense, Western powers are always given a privileged position 
over. Also, I, don't, I should just as a footnote, I don't really like talking about things in terms of East and West, but uh, can't, uh, that can't be helped right now. Um, um, I, think, uh, um, I think Heidegger, in a way, sees it in a danger, but also the reason, because it gives the illusion of progress in this very Hegelian sense, it makes it much harder to resist from a kind of non-European perspective. As the Japanese interlocutor states, the incontestable dominance of your European reason is thought to be confirmed by the success of, ra- of that rationality which technical advances set before us at every turn. Now that might read like Heidegger as being very Eurocentric, but it, it, as this is Heidegger, it's fundamentally not there, uh, well explain. Um, uh, I think Heidegger sees the world that we are in, the current global situation, as being the result of the Europeanisation. Uh, and it is, in a sense, that which makes dialogue much harder. Um, now, the Kyoto School would be, um, is a movement in Japanese thought which Nishitani is commonly lumped together with. I think it's actually not necessarily that helpful to lump together the Kyoto School thinkers as if though there is one single Kyoto school position. Um, I would say in taking Nishida, Nishitani's predecessor, as an example, it would appear that the Kyoto school thinkers are in fact heading in the opposite direction to Heidegger. Um, Say, if you take Nishida's basic project of using metaphysical language language quite heavily derived from European thought to articulate the Zen tradition as a kind of abstract system, God, nothingness. Um, I I should say I'm not an expert on Nishida, so at least least the way I'd understand it, it is um, running contrary to what Heidegger, at least very least it's fair to say Heidegger is suspicious of attempts to articulate non-European traditions in metaphysical language, in language taken from the European tradition. Uh, so say if you interpret nothingness sunyata as God, I think Heidegger would not agree with any position which would take that view. Um, or at least, and that, well, my style card is perhaps someone a bit different, but certainly if you take kind of classical, do any kind of classical Western concept of God and interpret in a kind of interchange of this and you have to then Heidegger is fundamentally against that. I think Heidegger is generally suspicious about what we would commonly call comparative philosophy. In a sense, I feel Heidegger's dialogue on language is almost set up to make comparative philosophy more difficult in that he's suspicious about drawing direct parallels. He's suspicious about, say, using aesthetic terms to talk about Japanese art even. Um, people might say he overdoes this, but I, that's the key thing. Um, I think the key point where Heidegger and Nishitani link together is the way that Nishitani actually stands out from what we broadly would call the Kyoto School. Um, insofar as, while he does at times parallel, say, Sunyata with Master Eichhardt, he views the Japanese tradition as broadly distinct from the European thought. Uh, this, tri- this distinction can be seen in the criticisms that Nishitani makes of both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche's understandings of Buddhism. He regards these, both these interpretations as still being very much shaped by Christianity. He sort of views Schopenhauer as being sympathetic to Buddhism but completely misunderstanding it, Buddhism. Nietzsche has been totally unsympathetic to Buddhism, also having misunderstanding Buddhism, but for Nishitani, Nietzsche is also the closest Western thinker to Buddhism, much closer than uh, uh, Nishida, no, not Nishida, Schopenhauer, um, without him even realising it. Um, anyway, I'd say the key thing is for Nishitani, as Robert Carter states, the overriding physical philosophical problem was no longer the bridging of Eastern and Western philosophical traditions through the adoption of Western terminology and method, but the overcoming overcoming of a growing sense of meaningless depression and despair that now extend more or less around the world. I would say this is also the case for Heidegger. In a sense, for both Heidegger and Nishitani, there is no way out of Europeanisation um, um, and nihilism. Um, 
which has become global. So in a sense, the possibility of a dialogue on equal terms between two different traditions has almost gone already. But we uh, need to uh, take things a stage further. We need to uh, create a kind of transformation. Um, uh, not by drawing a kind of comparison between East Asian and Western thought, uh, but rather um, through planetary thinking, uh, which I will explain shortly. Um, Brett Davis uh, comments Heidegger's preference for patiently waiting rather than rashly embarking on this kind of new planetary thinking uh, is a luxury not afforded to non-Westerners whose lives are already profoundly affected by global Westernisation. I would say it's, in a sense, difficult to swim against the tide of history, which is what I feel both Nishitani and Heidegger are trying to do. And I think Nishitani is the example of a non-European thinker who, in a sense, is also, whose work is, in the same way as Heidegger, is, in a sense, constructing this transformation of planetary thinking on the, along the same lines as Heidegger. Um, to counter um, Europeanisation, both Nishitani and Heidegger uh, uh, proceed to put an end to the traditional metaphysical philosophy and, to re- and see this end of Western philosophy as presenting the opportunity for the recovery of the marginalised non-European traditions of thought. Um, this dialogue between Heidegger and the East Asian world is still quite controversial in thought. People often like to dismiss it or say, well, Heidegger was never really in that interesting. Well, to be honest, I don't necessarily care that much what Heidegger thought as a person on a day-to-day basis. But um, I would say from his actual uh, work, people often cite, say, the Spiegel interview, in order to achieve a shift in thinking, umdenken, uh, one needs a European tradition and a new appropriation of it. Thinking will only be transforming, transformed through thought that is the same origin and determination. This is often meant to say, well, Heidegger is not interested in any transformation from the East Asian world. Heidegger's, it's only the West talking to the West or the U- Europe talking to itself. However, I th- it, I, either ha- um, Heidegger in his previous statement famously says, who of us can say whether or not in Russia and China the ancient traditions of thought will awaken that will assist the enabling for human beings a free relation to technical world. Now, either we have to read these as a self-contradiction in the same interview, which I won't, um, which, yes, if people want to read it like that, fine. But um, if we consider the statements in the context of Heidegger's broader thought, um, Heidegger states, a dialogue with thinkers who are the foundation of the Western philosophical tradition is a precondition of the inevitable dialogue with the East Asian world. I, I, it's a double move. We have to begin by looking into the Western tradition, which has become globalised, which has, in a sense, globalised itself and is the foundation of the modern technocratic, nihilistic world that we live in. Uh, but at the same time, by this dialogue with the dominant tradition and, a, um, and also challenging the dominant tradition is, um, enables or prepares is the preparation for the second movement dialogue which is equal if not more important which is a precondition for the inevitable dialogue with the East Asian World War. The idea is Heidegger is I'd say anxious to avoid a kind of superficial appropriation of Zen which is something I would say you do see in modern Western society, the kind of ubiquitous cultural appropriation, which in danger becomes superficial because they do not engage with the kind of dominant, with history and the way it's developed, the way the um, history, um, they do not deal with the kind of um, dominant tradition. And so in a way, you need to subvert the dominant tradition, which is the engagement with European metaphysics, and the second stage, uh, recovering non-European thought as a counter against this. Um, uh, both Heide- um, uh, I would say Heidegger's thought, if anything, can be accused of a kind of 
inverse Eurocentrism insofar as European philosophy is given a uniquely pernicious role. Also, by the way, people often cite that Heidegger, oh, Heidegger says philosophy is um, Greek in origin. Uh, it's quite notable, Heidegger in a uh, conversation with John Bouffray claimed, um, or at least through John Bouffray states, um, that uh, well, philosophy was exported um, very late in the day to China by Mao. Notably, Heidegger's very little interest in Mao. In fact, the only statement I've ever found from Heidegger about Chen and Mao is, uh, well, not actually Heidegger, it's his brother, is Mao Tse is the gestalt of Lao Tse, which is actually, I wish was from Heidegger, but that's only his brother doing an impression of him. It's a story I can talk about later. But anyway, yes, for Heidegger, philosophy is metaphysics. He says that directly, I would say. Philosophy is equated with this kind of European metaphysical tradition, which I, for him is about looking to a ground of being, i.e. a supreme being, a being of beings, um, um, a grounding principle, which is something Heidegger is deliberately trying to at least twist his way from, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, in fact, Heidegger talks in his later writing about his own thought thinking as Denken rather than philosophy. I'd say Denken is actually a privileged position for Heidegger rather than philosophy. And I think Heidegger, if anything, has an inverse Eurocentrism with European philosophy giving a kind of pernicious, or at least post Socratic European philosophy, pernicious role leading to nihilism. Um, whereas Nishitani, by contrast, appears to take a positive view of the Meiji Restoration, which restarted Japanese. National isolation, which ended isolation and restarted Europeanization, as an account as accounted by Nishitani. From the beginning, the Westernization of Japan was clearly a national resolution of a kind rarely found in the history of the world. It was forced on us from outside by enormous pro progress of world history, and at the same time, it was impelled by a powerful will from within. Uh, this distinguishes it from the Europeanisation of other non-European nations and no doubt proves greatness to the people who led Japan um, uh, around the Meiji Restoration. I'd say this almost directly contrasts with Heidegger's discussion of the busy developers who rushed the developing countries into Westernisation in a way that's thoughtless, seen as destructive. Um, I'd say if anything... This might be a controversial point again, but I think, if anything, Heidegger might have some sympathy with the pre-Meiji Restoration government, the Togokakwa uh, shogunate, the idea of Japanese isolationism as keeping out Gestel, keeping out technology, also keeping out onto theology, expelling the Jesuits, after all, could be held as expelling Western metaphysics. That's, I'd say, something, approach that Heidegger is not unsympathetic to. Or at least it would seem Heidegger's thought is not necessary. But I'd say, nonetheless, for both Heidegger and Nishitani, whether we like it or not, there's no way back uh, from Europeanisation, and there is nowhere left beyond the reach of um, Europeanisation. And crucially, Nishitani admits the Meiji Restoration. The Japanese at the time were not aware of the extreme anxiety the leading European thinkers were feeling about themselves, about Europe, as uh, they were not interested in the spiritual depth, but only the more or less external matters such as politics, economics, military concerns, and so forth. For Nishitani, the crisis which Heidegger's thought expresses and which, Heidegger, uh, which Nishitani refers to as Europeanization is brought to Japan during the Meiji Restoration. Um, like Nishitani, uh, Heidegger also sees um, nihilism is emerging from European philosophy. Um, a question, I would say both the thing, uh, uh, Nishitani then states uh, nihilism should be understood as teaching a Japanese to return to our forgotten selves and to reflect on the tradition of Oriental culture. I would say this is also the task of Heidegger's dialogue. In a sense, Heidegger's dialogue, I'd say, is more of a kind of preparation for a dialogue rather than the complete work itself. It does not offer simple conclusions that the reader can take away. It's more kind of preparation and a preparation for the possibility of recovering, recovering 
uh, East Asian tradition once we've, as it were, gone through the metaphysical history of Europe and come out. Good question how we come out, but and what we can do afterwards. Um, uh, fundamentally, both Nishitani and Heidegger considered Western philosophy and religion as having been focused in the search for ground or explanation of being. Heidegger sees Western philosophy as defined by forgetfulness of being. By this, he doesn't mean that Westerners uh, haven't um, thought about being or ontology, but rather that being has always been grounded in some kind of higher reality. Um, this is why, um, back even further than people like Descartes, uh, the key thing for both Heide Heidegger is Plato and the two worlds doctrine, where the eidos becomes the true nature of reality. And then I'd say Nishitani more than Heidegger actually focuses on the, whereas Heidegger tends to focus on the god of philosophers in a very abstract way. Nishitani draws our attention specifically to the Judeo-Christian religious tradition where it explains Christian doctrine of creator, ex nihila, a God who transcends the nihility that forms the ground of the entities he creates, i.e. the God who gives being to beings, God as the ground, in Heidegger's terms, onto theology. And I think Nishitani sees this as in a sense being the supreme person, the person of persons. Uh, to use uh, Louis Althusser's um, uh, terms, the subject par excellence, um, I am that I am. Um, I think both Heidegger and the Shitani see this as being continued in um, modern, modern European metaphysics, um, where, where the shift becomes away from God to um, uh, the grounding of the self, which is what we talked about earlier with the cogito, the idea of the grounding of self. Um, um, and as Heidegger states, um, the new world of the modern age has its own historical ground in the place where every history seeks its essential ground, namely metaphysics, e.g., God, in a sense, becomes replaced by the subject as the ground into being. Um, and the ultimate um, uh, development of this tradition of Western metaphysics for both um, uh, for Heidegger is um, the end of philosophy proves to be the triumph of manipulable arrangement of scientific technological world uh, of the social order. Uh, pro proper to this world. The end of philosophy means the beginning of the world civilization based on Western European thinking. Um, the idea that beings now become essentially defined by their utility. Um, so say that tree out there might be some uh, future uh, either tourist attraction, that's still utility. If you're going to places travelling for tourism, that's still in a way kind of leisure industry um, but it might be like wood, uh, fuel, whatever. The world is, um, is defined by this. Uh, it's kind of a bit misleading that Heidegger calls this technology because we all too often sort of think about technology in a very kind of general thing. So you talk about a caveman had technology, say hammers or flint knives. I think for Heidegger, it is a way of seeing the world, a way of disenchantment with beings, um, which... I also see in Nishitani that eventually the field of which the machine comes into being as a field of neutral alliance between abstract intellect in the quest for scientific rationality and the denaturalisation of nature discloses nihility, both at the ground of man who re relies on the intellect and at the ground of the world of nature. I'd say this also brings the key thing is one sees at the end of this through this uh, technology is the nihility, nothingness, nihilism, which is where things, where things can possibly change. Um, sharing this similar basic understanding, Nishitani and Heidegger are then faced with the question of how to twist out of this situation. It is in this project of responding to technology and nihilism that they raise the possibility of recovering these days from tradition. In Nishitani words, the tradition must be rediscovered uh, from the ultimate point where it is grasped in advance as the end 
eschaton, which is quite a significant word, of our westernisation and of western civilization. It's a very apocalyptic language. I think it's very hard not to hear. It's easy to imagine the music from Wagner's Gotterdammeron playing in that uh, bit. As it's, um, also some, um, I'd say it's also uh, parallels Heidegger's talk about the new beginning or um, uh, the use of um, overtly eschatological language is in uh, Nishitani, Nishitani's thought uh, it appears very incongruous, especially as in religion and nothingness. And Nishitani sees uh, eschatology as a specifically Judeo Christian notion of time. This eschaton in view involves a kind of linear progress of history. Um, thus, he describes what would appear to be the implosion of uh, Western thought uh, uh, from within itself, but in Western terms. Uh, might be suspicious as well for Heidegger's use of eschatology that this represents in Brett Davis's terms yet another work, metaphysical will to final results. And generally, there's perhaps a suspicion in both Nishitani and Heidegger that there is lurking some kind of Judeo Christian God who's somehow organising things historically. I would say this is a mistake uh, to take this too literally. For one thing, neither Heidegger and Nishitani really consider that they have a kind of historical guarantee of victory. In fact, quite the contrary, they are fighting against current history. And I, there is no literal messiah who's going to come and save us all. Um, Heidegger's God in the Spiegel interview is something perhaps a bit different, which I'll get on to. Um, I think what this eschatology could rather be seen was the ultimate point where you might seek the realisation that enables a transformation beyond metaphysical thinking. It's in a sense, we can think of it as eschatology before we reach it. Um, now, finally, turning the turn, turning to Sunyata, or the turn in Sunyata. Um, Heidegger's care, which commonly said to mark the division between uh, Heidegger as early and later thought, is still remains one of his um, uh, most controversial aspects of his philosophy, and people do have different uh, translations or interpretations. But I've said. Um, uh, it could be understood in, Nishitani, in aligned with Nishitani's thought as loss of both classical metaphysics and subjectivism and a transformation um, that can be considered along the lines of Nishitani's sunyata, where both the thinkers go beyond nihilism. The central focus of Heidegger's early writings uh, is on Dasein, as you were saying, mindness. Um, which, while Heidegger is nonetheless trying to step outside the subject as a way of thinking ourselves, it still so implies at least a residual degree of anthropocentrism. Um, Heidegger's thought, we can say, perhaps early thought, still has a sense of ourselves, Dasein, being able to drown our own being, at least in so far. I think it's a mistake to read Heidegger's thought in an entirely Sartarian existential terms that we can have the radical freedom. But nonetheless, um, it's given, Dasein is given a prime, primary role of um, organising and structuring reality. Um, whereas, and again, there are people who dispute this reading. Um, uh, following, um, I, but I'm going to follow Richard Copiano's uh, interpretation of later Heidegger as acknowledging the primacy and irreducibility of the truth of being in relation to the human being's meaning structure. The idea that being is prior to human beings as a making, as a meaning structure. Um, and that this shift away from a subjective understanding of the self as a ground of being in the Shatani, uh, Keiji's thought is associated with the great doubt in Zen. I also said I can see parallels with this kind of transformation between the early and late Heidegger. Um, Nishitani um, uh, sees the crisis of Western philosophy, which Heidegger uh, as representing 
a chance to pass again, pass back by calling into question our grounding, by the fact we call into question ourselves, we abandon the self-centred egotism by seeing it as a crisis. And this enables a great doubt, um, um, which at the same time, um, for Nishitani, um, it is a standpoint of at which absolute negation is at the same time a great affirmation. It is not a standpoint that only states itself and things are empty, but rather the foundations of the standpoint of Sinyata lie elsewhere, not in the self that is empty, but in the emptiness of self, not in things that are empty, but in the emptiness of things. This is uh, through the realization one can see beings as they are, seeing emptiness. One also sees oneself as they are, which is emptiness. And this is what I would say parallels Heidegger shift away from any ground of being to the truth of beings. The idea for the late Heidegger, there is no essential being that's standing over and above all beings, but there is just the being of beings, i.e. the being of this paper, the being of this table. There's no God with a capital G. Um, some may consider Heidegger's thought conflicting with Nishitani's notion of Sinyata. As Shizio Udia noted, a basic tendency of Western philosophers, philosophies of Nietzsche, Heidegger and deconstruction as heading towards nothingness. However, we can view the thought of Nishida and Nishitani with Eastern traditions in their background as, on the whole, moving in a direction from nothingness. Um, for Heidegger, uh, nothingness is, um, I'd say, um, for the, this would interpret for Heidegger, nothingness is something that comes from outside and may appear as a threat um, to Western thought. For Nishitani, nothingness is a fact and basis of thought. This might be the case for Heidegger's early writings, notably being in time, um, where uh, nothingness is associated with mortality. Also, it's a ground of our authenticity, um, but it's still it's something we first fear and then ultimately live with. Um, I would say for Heidegger's later writings, he has moved from seeing nothingness as ground for bleak but heroic authenticity to a more positive sense of nothingness as emptiness. This can be seen in the thing where he states, the vessel's thingness does not lie in all material of which it consists, but in the void that it holds. Nothingness or emptiness is the imminent of the beings. It is the truth of being instead of the opposite of being. Thus it is an error to see Heidegger's uh, later uh, thought and Shitani's simply as a dichotomy between being in the West, nothingness in the East. Um, being, um, uh, sim, uh, as we can see along similar lines, Nishitani states that true emptiness is not to be positive as something outside of or and other than being, rather it is realised as something united to and self-identical with being. Um, thus I would say, um, Sunyata presents the truth of being for Heidegger uh, in his later writings. Um, so we know that once in Heidegger, this means that approaching Nietzsche's death of God, unlike other Westerners thinkers, he does not see this loss of ground as simply an abyss of nihilism. This might be a kind of a positive abyss or a negative abyss, like Schopenhauer, you might say, well, you should give up, or Nietzsche, where you, this, is, this abyss is your chance to impose your will. I would say Heidegger rejects both of those, but rather... The abyss is the truth of being. The abyss just is. Uh, as Heidegger shows, it states, as the shrine of nothing, death harbours within itself the presence of being. As the shrine of nothing, death is the shelter of being. Nothingness or emptiness is part of being, not to be overcome or feared. Thus, for both Nishitani and Heidegger, the notions of nothingness and being are not just opposed, and they enable us to pass through nihilism and the end of Western metaphysics. I'd say this is more like a kind of... I'd say what differs from the overcoming of West metaphysics would be the Nietzsche. That still has a kind of metaphysical will, a creation of a new god. For Heidegger, in a way, we just take a step back and see things as they are, which I'd say is similar to what Nishitani is doing. 
Both Heidegger and Nishitani reach a point that is beyond um, non um, nihilism by constructing a non metaphysical way of thinking outside the categories of subject and object. For both Nishitani and Heidegger, such thinking entails relating to ordinary entities in a different way. I would say this is where this seems to very much contrast with the very grand eschatological visions of the, few, of the new beginning or whatever. But it is a point where Heidegger finally tr achieves a transformation. Um, this understanding of entities, in Nishitani's terms, suchness, contra contrasts with a metaphysical, in Heidegger's terms, of grounds of beings. And so suchness, um, as Nishitani states, suchness is on the near side, much, norm, much uh, more so than we normally regard our own self. So in a way, it's seeing the everyday, not seeing, not looking to any transcendental high other, but we simply see things like this chair, that table, that table, uh, that table, that radiator, everything is such suchness. We see suchness just looking at, just being in the being of beings in Heidegger's terms. Heidegger too focuses on ordinary entities in his discussion of desking. Uh, here's an example of the wine jug. Um, uh, a sense of particular. Yes, right, uh, we're almost finished. But I'd say a sense of the particular well, um, is crucial to the particularity of the particular the fact that things particularly are, like this table is, is crucial to both Heidegger and Nishitani. As Nishitani states, all is one. By this, Nishitani does not mean there's a kind of Vedanta style supreme reality that is the all, but rather each particular entity is part of the one, is in a sense one, is there. And that is such as, such as this table is being, this table is also semiotic. Um, you might say Heidegger's fourfold when it's counter to Nishitani. I'd say this is not the case. It's a misunderstanding to see Heidegger's gods as metaphysical in a kind of classic Western sense being a ground being. They are rather, to be more closely understood as kami, um, i.e. imminent presences of mystery in the world. I have written a paper on this if anyone's interested, but I can't really go into it too much detail. But the gods and the fourfold, each point is not so much, is never a kind of absolute supreme reality. The gods are sky mortals, each one defined by their relation to, it, to each other. There is no one centre, no supreme being, no ground. They just are and stand in relation to each other. Thus, I would say both Heidegger and Nishitani um, uh, step out, um, uh, reject both pre-modern Western metaphysics with a notion of uh, higher realities and the modernist inversion of, based on the idea of the subject. Uh, they cannot be classified in metaphysical terms as either atheist, theist, or deist. You know, this includes pantheist. Um, they are, in a sense, a religion of things or a religion of suchness. Um, they are um, not an atheism in the usual sense, even less classifying, normally theism. They are neither mechanist in Chinese words, they are neither mechanistic world of modern science nor theological world of our metaphysics. It is the yonder side of all uh, determinations, again, in Shitani. But the yonder side is precisely to return to our near side, return to the everydayness, return to the world that we see, return to this table. And so we step outside Western metaphysics. Thank you. Sorry I overran. <laughs> Thank you. 
Was Heidegger um, aware of Mishima and what uh, Mishima, um, what how Mishima used Heidegger um, in those novels? And did Heidegger have any thoughts on Mishima's perspective on nihilism and his ideas about the emperor, um, which he incorporated all of Heidegger's ideas? Well, I, but one interesting quote that I've got from Heidegger about his, uh, is, I think Heidegger in his dialogue and language actually uh, says that he asked Tanabe why um, the Japanese did not recall their own venerable beginnings instead of chasing after the latest news from Western philosophy. I often think that's possibly Heidegger actually, was well, possibly a kind of bit of a critique of the Kyoto School's interest in Western metaphysics, but also I'm wondering if it's perhaps Heidegger actually worrying that his own thought is actually contributing to the Europeanization of Japan and whether Heidegger in fact on some levels would prefer the Japanese to be reading the Doji or the Kajiki rather than reading Being in Time but I don't know, maybe that's just um, my interpretation I think uh, Heidegger's influence in Japan kind of came about a bit before this was already known um, but I think there's already an interest in phenomenology in Heidegger's early works in phenomenology I think partly Husserl was also had already had quite influence over Nishida. I don't know so much about us, uh, about Nishida and herself, but I think there was already an interest in German philosophy in Japan before Heidegger. Um, but um, I've never heard anything to suggest that Heidegger uh, was aware that much of uh, Yukio Mishima. It would be very, very interesting to write a comparison because I can see some interesting points of discourse. Uh, or some interesting points of connections between Heidegger's thought and uh, Mishima, particularly his critiques of Europeanisation. I'd say that perhaps Heidegger might at least see, at least in his later writings, might still see um, Mishima as being too hooked up with the idea of kind of will and in a way still too Nietzsche and still hooked up with the idea that you can, by an act of will, even if it's a very kind of futile act of committing suicide, in a way that seems futile, I think Heidegger almost... Well, there's, yeah, there's also Heidegger's own political engagement in the early 1930s, which I try not to <laughs> go into. Uh, which I do see definite parallels between that stage in Heidegger's work and Mishima. In fact, I often think in many ways Heidegger's nationalism in the mid-30s does have a lot in common with Japanese nationalism, and they both have a, a kind of a, mi- a mystical sense of nationhood and national mission and sacrifice, and also a bit of an obsession with death. But um, I don't know if anyone knows anything where Heidegger talks about UK or Mishima. I'd be very interested to know, but I really don't know that there is. Sorry. It's not about Mishima, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to pick up on your use of the word. Europeanization, and is there a particular reason for this? Does Nishitani use it? And is it fair to Japanese intellectual history? So perhaps we can utilize Amanda's conceptual apparatus and this idea of historical inaccuracy. So you can see that if uh, Nishitani does it, it could be in response to the Cold War. And sort of this criticism that Japan sort of unknowingly took on Westernization wholesale without sort of reflective criticism. So perhaps uh, Nishitani qualifies that by responding and saying, oh, well, actually, um, we are uh, how to become ourselves again. But if we look back to pre Edo, uh, Bakamatsu, uh, theorists like Bukazawa Yukichi, so he was very aware of what they were doing, and it wasn't so much Europeanization, but it was a sense sort of modernize or decolonize. They'd kind of seen what had happened in sort of China and elsewhere. And so we kind of look at so the samurai only ever constituted 9% of the Japanese population. So in a war, there was no chance they could compete with a conscript army. So the idea was that if they kind of got rid of the feudal hierarchy, if it became more democratic, then they could train soldiers. So see the, the idea, it's not so much Europeanization, it's not trying to be like something else, but it's modernizing so that they can compete with, but nevertheless, there's still this idea of wanting to preserve their culture and history and their sense of who they are. So perhaps it's not that it was lost, but 
you could say that this historical inaccuracy of Nishitani accepting or thinking that Lowell is correct and uh, responding to it? Well, thank you for raising that point. Well, I, I'm not an expert on... My expertise is much later than this, so I, 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 I can't give detailed analysis of the Meiji Restoration. Um, at least as I understand, um, I think this is, well, um, Nishitani certainly sees, I suppose, I think perhaps in part Nishitani sees Meiji Restoration being as the start of Europeanisation, but that's gradually got even more so, that it much more far reaching. He perhaps me, as I said in the quote, he's not totally. He does see Europeanisation as being historically necessary, and he was perhaps aware, or at least opening up to the West as being historically necessary in that stage, because they were aware the other choice was being colonised by the West. And it was understandable. If I, if I had been in the Japanese government at the time, I would have done it. I think he perhaps does see it... Um, I think perhaps a way he's perhaps concerned is the belief in the West, Westerners, what you might call the kind of cultural cringe that the Japanese sort of pick up in that period, in that they're seeing that West, Western thought or Western philosophy. Um, I think to begin with the idea that they need to put so much emphasis on technological power and technological development, which is understandable from their perspective, but I think it's for both Nishitani and Heidegger already an act of Europeanisation when you sort of investing in, in industrialization. They're both, this is perhaps maybe a limitation of both Heidegger and Shatana, because I don't necessarily want to agree with everything they say, but I think they're both critical. They both do see Europeanization as having very far-reaching consequences, but perhaps in, it's superficial in the Meiji Restoration, but it's nonetheless far-reaching. And there was, um, in the Meiji Restoration, a, a lot of I've read about the Meiji Restoration, I won't claim to be an expert, so um, there were, there's tensions within Japanese society in the Meiji Restoration between elements who are perhaps more Europeanising, some are reacting more against it. I think perhaps the problem for both Heidegger and Nishitani is, in a way, it would not be possible to avoid Europeanising to begin with for anywhere, because you would either get colonised or have to do what Japan did. I think Nish Nishitani is actually quite proud of the fact that Japan wasn't colonised, unlike China and every other country in the world, but they needed to do European ways. Okay, so, yeah. is there so. Um, just Can I just respond? I would say perhaps both Heidegger and right, both Heidegger and Nishitani are a bit sweeping at times. I, I agree, but on the other hand, I would say that they do provide important insights. I say particularly the issue of Europeanisation. 
And, but it's all too easy, in a sense, to forget that the world as it is today is, in a sense, a product of what European powers have done to it in various ways. Um, I don't think we can get around that. Um, uh, I don't necessarily agree with Heidegger on everything. I think one point where Heidegger is obviously limited is the fact he only sees metaphysics in his terms as being European. I'd say Indian thought should, in Heidegger's terms, at least some strands with Indian thought, like Vedanta, obviously would appear to count as metaphysical in the sense of idea of a true world. I think Heidegger and Nishitani provide at least the beginnings of foundation. They perhaps need work in areas around the edges. But I still see uh, we need to... Have, you need to at least have some sort of sense of history and how things develop. I don't think we... I think unionisation is a key concept in Heidegger, which perhaps needs to be more considered in a more nuanced way. But nonetheless, sh we shouldn't abandon Heidegger and abandon Nishitani just because we don't have to dogmatically agree with that. But also, I think Heidegger's actually a bit more nuanced about unionisation than the Shitani, and if you still, you still get comments like um, in, uh, Japanese interlocutor in dialogue with the states, that perhaps whereas in Japan, the technological world you may only confine is only surface matters. In a sense, there might still be something that's beyond. I'd say that's the opposite way, opposite approach in the sense the idea that there's still case that Japan, the way that some thinkers like, I think, Kubrick Dreyfus actually talks about the idea of Japan as having, as being a surf, an example of a surf, which both has high technology but nonetheless preserves the kind of non technological sense of being in Hazardous terms. And so, yeah, I think we can have more nuanced readings, but we should not abandon that. Let's have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.